Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! News from Brussels. Boris Johnson has welcomed the European Union's unqualified solidarity and support today on the Skripal case. <sighs> EU partners are clear that Russia must provide immediate, full, complete disclosure of its Novichok program, a powerful political union that we are um, uh, desperately keen to enjoy the support of and which Boris Johnson bears personal responsibility for swathes of decent patriotic people in this country being persuaded against their own interests, against the national interest and, it would appear, against national security as well. Boris Johnson's entire career built on persuading people that they should leave it. How dare he? Serious, sorry, I know we're not supposed to be talking about Brexit today, but how dare he? His entire career, after being fired from the Times for making up quotes from his own godfather, hinged upon lobbing abuse of Brussels back to Britain in the hope of whipping up the crusty old colonels reading the Daily Telegraph into some sort of quasi-xenophobic fervour. And my God, it worked. It's even in his own autobiography. Or one account of his years in Brussels as the Daily Telegraph's correspondent. Couldn't quite believe the response I got when I sent back all these stories about bananas. So I just sent more and more and more. Read the bloke who turned up. Follow me on Twitter. You can find it, at Mr James O'B. It's in, it's in the last ten things I've tweeted. The bloke who took up the Brussels job for the Times a few years after Johnson had left and just described absolutely surreal disassociation from reality. All the news editors looking for stories about bananas, stories about hoovers, stories about uh, bureaucrats and excessive red tape. Regardless of the truth, just get me something like this. The readers love it. Boris Johnson created that industry. He created it. And now he's there. I, I, it, it, it actually, of all the Brexit stories, this perhaps is the one that beggars belief the most. Now he's there, wobbling around the city, trying to somehow paint unqualified solidarity from the European Union as a good thing while simultaneously carrying the can for our collective decision to withdraw from the unqualified solidarity that we already had. I, I just begin to wonder now when, when the string is going to snap. I appreciate that I haven't really done a very good job of keeping people who voted to leave the European Union on side. Um, not the people who follow the Boris Johnson school of blind, bloviating prejudice, but I've kept everybody else on side. The people telling me that, well, my string snapped six months ago, Jan, I saw the light yesterday, I saw the light. How can anybody look at this man today trumpeting the importance of unqualified solidarity with the European Union while simultaneously bearing more responsibility than any person in Britain for our decision to eschew that unqualified solidarity in favour of absolute chaos and ignorance? And he's the Foreign Secretary. Our interests are being represented in Brussels by a man who has spent 30 years misrepresenting and maligning the far from perfect people that work there and consider the European project to be a thing of importance and beauty. Why? So that when a state like Russia launches a murder attempt on our soil, our response can be collective. Do you know what we are? We are now, thanks to Boris Johnson, we're a country that thinks we can play better football on our own than we can with 10 other players on our team. This is what Boris Johnson represents. That's what English exceptionalism is. The idea that on our own we can somehow perform better than we can as beneficiaries of what he today calls unqualified solidarity. And if you expect anyone to hold him to account for this weapons-grade hypocrisy, I would advise you not to hold your breath. They choose where he appears pick their interviews, they pick their journalists, they pick their questions, and they continue to get away with it. There are one or two glorious exceptions, but it is absolutely relevant to almost everything we discuss on this programme that nobody is holding Boris Johnson to account for creating a situation in which we cannot expect, but must instead request, unqualified solidarity from our soon-to-be ex-partners. 
Rant over. Nine minutes after 11. Time for a complete change of pace. Um, I find the transgender issue troubling on, on many, many levels. I find it troubling because I get a bit confused. I find it troubling because it seems to have become one of those areas where you, you sort of get a free pass on the kind of thing that would probably in the context of homosexuality it would no longer be acceptable behavior but you can say things about trans people you can write things about transgender people that are i mean as close to 1970s style homophobia albeit with a different target that it is possible to imagine but equally equally there are issues here that continue to to, to puzzle me not least the problem that you have and it is a problem, and I, and I am sort of moving towards a better understanding of it. But I think it's perfectly reasonable to, to remain confused by the notion of simply being able to state what gender you are, to self-identify as male. So there were two stories this weekend that really drew my attention to this. The first involved two topless female swimmers invading a men-only swimming session to protest against transgender rules. The, 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 the issue here is women who have segregated spaces being profoundly uncomfortable about the idea of people who were born men i'm going to say penis is that all right can i say penis i just did people who were born and still possess penises but identify as female now i happen to believe that that is a perfectly plausible and um and real state but what a lot of women fear is dishonesty so this is for me it's all about trust so how much should bona fide transgender people, transgender women in this case, how much should they suffer or be treated differently from biological women as a result of the lack of trust, the fear that some human beings in possession of a penis will pretend that they self-identify as a female in order to gain access to um, and potentially uh, abuse or assault women in areas that would once have been their safe space. This oddly, and uh, unless you really do spend a lot of time in the murkiest depths of the internet, the last time we talked about this, I was trying to have a conversation about spending the previous weekend in a changing room at H&M at Henny's with my nine-year-old daughter and, and suggesting that there is absolutely no circumstance in which I should be prevented from doing that. But because it's, it's not exactly my field of expertise, um, and I took a call from a woman who... Um, how can I put this politely? She, 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 she certainly seemed to feel a lot more strongly about the issue than I do. And it, it, the, the conversation sort of transmogrified into a, uh, into a place where kind of being cast as someone who thinks that men with or people with penises should be able to just waltz unmolested through the female changing rooms of, of shops and swimming pools. I, that's just nuts, obviously, if you pardon the pun. But the point remains... How do you treat the people that are telling the truth? Uh, this, it seems to me, is the entire tension of the transgender debate now. I know, uh, I, I know a bloke who has, who was born without a penis, but is now a man. Okay, Th these are really confusing issues for people that, that are new to them. And similarly, I know women who no longer who were born with penises but no longer have them. And I know people in between the two, and I haven't yet met one who is acting in bad faith. But the fear of people acting in bad faith is what drives a lot of this debate, he says, with a degree of confidence and the knowledge that I might even have got this wrong. And and that, I think, is where these two stories come in. One involves topless female swimmers invading a men-only swimming session to protest against transgender rules. And the other involved um, a Labour Party activist, a transgender Labour Party activist, complaining on social media at the weekend that when she went to a nightclub, she was frisked by a man. Now, when I say a transgender activist it's a it's a human being who was born with male genitalia and i think still possesses them but wanted to be frisked by a woman because she now identifies as a woman now again i i believe that she's acting in good faith but when someone replied to her on twitter what's wrong with that what if the man that searched you identifies as a woman would that be okay suddenly my complete confusion about some areas of this conversation came into absolute relief that's the problem. People struggle to understand or to accept that you can just say what gender you are. 
You can just say it. And despite being the possessor of a penis, if I state today that I'm a woman, I can waltz into the ladies' toilets, I could waltz into the ladies' changing room, and uh, even more remarkably, I could end up in a women's prison if I were to commit a crime at any point in the near future. And I make no apology for finding that profoundly confusing and troubling. But I think, and this is what I meant when I somewhat facetiously suggested before the 11 o'clock news that I've solved all of these problems, I think it all comes down to trust. Doesn't it? I think it comes down to the question of what treatment people telling the truth receive gets diluted by the possibility of people not telling the truth. So here is a transgender woman who is lying. Here is a transgender woman who is pretending to be a woman so that he can get into changing rooms. And because these people exist or may exist, then all of the transgender women who are telling the truth must be treated differently. I think, he says, very, very cautiously, suffering from a rare outbreak of intellectual modesty, I think that may be it. And that means we just need to talk more to each other, doesn't it? Because there aren't many areas of life where you let the potential badness of an unspecified person impact upon how all the good people get treated. But it does happen. So should I be allowed into the changing room with my nine-year-old daughter? Well, yes, I should. But what if I was using my nine-year-old daughter for cover? I hope this works. If I'm using her as cover because I want to start peering through the keyholes or glancing over the top, I'm hoping to see you in your bra or even ideally without your bra on. But I'm with my nine-year-old girl, so she's my perfect cover. Do you see what I mean? So when you say to me you can't come into a female changing room because some men are perverts, you're, 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 you're saying, I think, that you're lying about why you're here with your daughter. You're not here to buy clothes at all. You're here to, to perv women. And therefore, if I was using a different tactic to get into somewhere for uh, nefarious or perverted reasons, I'd put a dress on and say that I'm a woman, even though you can tell by looking at me that I was born male, and even though I still possess a penis, I am self-identifying as a woman so I can get into this changing room and do bad stuff. And you then turn to every transgender woman and say, no, you're not allowed in here because you might be like him. And I am, at the moment, I think, closer to having sympathy with a lot of women who feel potentially exposed than I am, and I know this is not going to please everybody, than I am with a tiny number of transgender people who feel that they're discriminated against. And then you come to the, to the, to the other areas of segregation where how cross do we get? And it, you know, it happened in, in, in Christian communities in the last century in this country, so it's not by any means confined to Middle Eastern or Muslim people. But when we see segregation, when we see gender segregation in a public space, and we know that the subtext to it is quite often, oh, well, we can't have men and women mingling together because men will behave badly. Men won't be able to trust themselves. I, I resent that profoundly because the idea that men get a free pass on being aggressive or predatory or perverted, um, I appreciate that, that, you know, there are plenty of examples of men who boast about being predatory getting elected president of the United States. But for decent people, we shouldn't be cutting our cloth according to the inability of men to control their urges. And then you come to the trans issue, and it seems to me that we're in danger sometimes, sometimes, of doing something similar. So wh why can't this transgender woman go into that changing room? Well, because some men are so gross that they'll pretend to be transgender women in, in order to ogle or possibly even assault some of the women already in that changing room. So theoretically and intellectually, I can say that's not fair, but actually, in terms of interaction and, and reality, if I was that woman fearful that that transgender woman there is really pretending and is actually a man with unpleasant ambitions, I don't know that I've got the right to tell her what she can and can't do, but I don't know who does. We will talk. She's rung in. Hannah, one of the women who um, went swimming.
uh, to the men only session and either she'll pull me to pieces for having completely misrepresented this entire issue it wouldn't be the first time or we'll be able to learn from her about why she did it and, and where this remarkable issue goes next phone lines are open hit the numbers now you will get through 03456060973 is the number that you need and i need you to call me on this because um well, simply because I hope this doesn't come as a major shock to anybody. I don't really have any personal experience of the issues involved. Um, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC going, what's the Star Trek thing? Boldly going, not quite where no man has gone before, but uh, certainly into areas that are incredibly choppy and controversial. I didn't even know what TERF meant, which is a, an acronym that pops up with unerring frequency during these conversations. Um, it's a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. So this is the Germaine Greer type position that says if you were born with a penis, you can never be a woman. I had a conversation about trans issues with one of my daughters the other day, and she's been reading up about periods and menstruating and stuff like that. And we were talking about trans, and she said, but hang on a minute, if these people have never had periods and never menstruated, then they can't actually know what it's like to be a proper woman. And I thought, blimey, from the mouths of babes. But so that is another position. I'm not picking a side in this, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to let you force me to do so, but I am coming to an understanding of why trust is, as with many other social justice issues, trust is at the heart of this. But anyway, you've heard more than enough from me. Hannah is in Vauxhall. She is one of the two women who have prompted this conversation. Um, they went to a men-only swimming session yesterday, or, or this weekend, recently, she'll correct me in a minute, to protest against transgender rules. Hannah, I'm, I'm glad you're listening today, obviously. Um, talk me through why. Um, it's nothing to do with transgender. It's an issue with um, self-identification, which yes. is something that's trying to be brought in um, to process in, well, Swim England is one of the places that is using self-identification as a way that people can separate themselves rather than sex. And it's something that we feel quite strongly about, that um, changing rooms, for example, should be separated by sex, not by feelings. Yes, and that is built upon partly the idea that some people who are pretending to be transgender would use self-identification to access changing rooms full of women with potentially unpleasant and unhealthy uh, ambitions. That's right, right. but it's also about that. dignity. Yeah, a dignity being... Talk me through the dignity side of it. Well, anyone has a right to get changed in front of people that they feel comfortable with and people that they feel con they, that they have consented to get changed around. Yes. And we've been brought up in, in this country with the ability to get changed in front of people of, the own, of our own sex. And that's looking to be changed, but without actually involving women in the conversation, which is why we've been reduced to, to doing this Man Friday swim in order to force the conversation. Well, I, well, it's worked, because we're having it now. But you'll, you'll, well, you'll, you'll appreciate that, um, that there'll be a lot of confusion reigning among people listening. I, I, I find it almost... Oh, hang on, we've lost her on the phone line. We'll get her back in a minute. So I, I'll, I'll tell you what I think, and then when Hannah comes back, I'll tell her. Is she back? Hannah, can you hear me? Yes, I'm back. Oh, splendid. So... What, what, what I, I mean, I, I'm a middle-aged man who, who was pretty much unaware of these issues until five or six years ago, but, but you're describing circumstances in which if I describe myself as a woman, there's no checking process or criteria, forgive me for being a little glib, but there's no test I have to pass. I simply decide at the end of today's programme that I've been living a lie. I, I don't know, I don't decide that. I'm pretending that, and I would then be able to go into the changing rooms of a, of a swimming pool with I'm, and take my trunks off out. oh can we sort this phone line out this is quite important i'll have a quick word with barbara who's in islington barbara what's going on hi james hi, i barbara. totally agree with uh, the, the the two women about this self-identification thing i think it's i think wrong. i do but um, i i'm, I'm going to be running around well, like a go on tell me why um i was bought i mean you know what people don't understand about transgender I, i'm a post-op trans woman um i was born a woman but the trouble is it wasn't on the outside it was on the inside and it doesn't show till you go to the doctor and they can work out what's going on well now i know that you you agree with what amy was telling her, hannah was telling us but she thinks yeah. that what you're describing now are just feelings 
Um, if you only knew what you go through, they're not just feelings. They're. This is what I mean about not having. Uh, they rip you. They rip your heart. Uh, whatever it is, it rips your heart out. Basically, I'm telling you, it's not about feelings. It's about what you know of yourself. It's about understanding you. It, it, it's 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 so complicated. It really is hard to discuss this. I I I, I, be, I believe you. Let, let's find out from Hannah. She's back on the line now. And I'm, I'm not doing. Just stay stay there a second, Barbara. I'm not doing a, a, a kind of confected and and, and cynical um, gladiatorial combat. I just want to learn from both of you at the same time. So Hannah, while you dropped off, Barbara rang in, who is post-op trans woman. Um, she opposes self-identification as well. But I just want to pick up on your word feelings. Are, are, would you describe Barbara as someone who has undergone incredibly? Uh, uh, serious surgery as, as merely as a result of feelings? No, absolutely I wouldn't. Um, I think that Barbara has undergone um, serious surgery and serious transition and um, that is very different from someone self-identifying yes. woman and, and I think that conflating the two does Barbara quite the disservice. I think she believes that as well and to, to clarify then Barbara would be, you'd be comfortable with having Barbara in the same changing room as you? Yes, I, I think that I showed on, on Friday that I'm comfortable in any changing room. <laughs> I, I changed in the male changing room. Um, and actually, Amy and I didn't swim together. I changed on my own in the male changing room. But it's not about how I feel. No, well, I, then, I, I, then I must rephrase my question. You'd be comfortable with Barbara getting changed in, in a female changing room anywhere with anyone? Yes, I would. OK, I'm getting closer now to understanding it. And this is going to be slight, I hope not a stupid question. How far down the surgical route does a human being have to go before, in your view, they belong in the female changing room rather than in the male or, or indeed a third trans-type facility? I don't know. No, well, that's the problem, honest. isn't it? And, and I'm glad you're so honest. But that's why we need to have the conversation, and, and thus far we've been shut down in having the conversation. I'm sorry you feel that way. I, I mean, it, 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 I would have thought that people like Janice Turner writing in The Times and, and a lot of the coverage that I've seen had provided you with quite a big platform, but you would respond by saying that you quite often get shouted down for being turf or for being transphobic or for being... Right, I'll be back with you in, se in one second. The word turf, it's quite the slur. Is it? Yes. I only just found out what it meant, and now you're telling me I can't use it again. It's used as the new witch and far worse when describing uh, feminists. Okay, bear with me. I'm going to just bid farewell to Barbara. Barbara, um, you are against self-identification and, and you are post-op. I am post-op. GRC certificate, birth certificate, marriage certificate, I've got all of them. <laughs> What else can I do? In a, in a, in a sentence, because I'm already late for the news, and you can probably tell I'm doing slightly more heavy lifting intellectually than I usually do on the programme. In a sentence, why are you against self-identification? I just think it makes a mockery of what are, what transgender, true transgender people have to go through. But do, doesn't everybody do, doesn't everybody who goes through what you've been through have to self-identify first? They do, but you go to a clinic, James, you go for a whole lot of things, and believe me, you don't put yourself out there to look for trouble and go into places where you shouldn't be. No, you don't, but the fear is that someone else might... Uh, and it, but not if you're having surgery. Yeah. You're not going to have surgery in order to, to be able to perf people in a changing room, are you? But you might self-identify in order to do that. Yeah. Is yeah. it me, or am I making progress, Barbara? Um, I don't think we're getting anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and on that bombshell, um, I want Hannah to hang around. Can you see if she would mind? I just want to ask her a couple more questions. Barbara, you take care of yourself. Thank you so much for the call. I'll try and improve the delivery. Seven is the time. Back with one of the big issues of our time. And Hannah is on the line still. I'm so grateful to you for your time, Hannah. Hannah is one of the women who attended a men-only swimming event on Friday. Topless, um, uh, in order to make a point about self-identification. Um, and I suppose I would ask you this. I didn't know that there were moves in place to allow anyone who simply states that they're a woman to, to change in the communal changing areas of, of public swimming pools. We reached a point where we both accept that there is, a, there is a point at which someone born with a penis would be allowed in, should be allowed in, in both of our views, but that's probably going to involve surgery. We're just not yet quite sure how much surgery. How much of your motivation, Hannah, is fear of 
bad men pretending to self-identify as women in order to do bad things. Is that, and, and you must allow, allow my ignorance and innocence on this issue, is that the main driving force on positions like yours? Um, I think that we come with, with the two positions of safety and, as I said earlier, of dignity, that it's, it's two um, equally important issues. I don't, I, 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 you know that I'm on a, so the dignity issue is a little bit harder to understand because you'd be all right with Barbara. So it's just the point your dignity ceases to be impinged upon as, their, as the amount of penis they possess diminishes. It's not, it's not about my dignity, though. No. It's about the people that feel more vulnerable. It's about the people from... from um, yes, but you, you're, you, you've cast yourself as an activist and spokesperson for this, so, so I use your dignity just as a, yes. as a, as a figure but, but of speech. I'm that other people who have, have positions where they don't feel comfortable in, in front of people of the opposite sex, that we should respect that. There's a consent yes. issue involved. So I think that, yes, a, a big fear for me is that people will abuse self-identification and will... Um, walk into the wrong changing rooms on purpose for uh, nefarious purposes. Now, I, again, I'm not being glib, but, but I often take my daughters into the female changing rooms in shops. M not so much the older one now, but most recently my youngest, who's nine. Could I not be doing that with nefarious intent? I could be using my little girl, as it were, as, as camouflage for perverted conduct. Well, absolutely you could. And, right. and this is part of the problem, is I can't tell the difference with, between someone that's using their, their little girl as, as a shield or someone that, that's just going in to help them try on an outfit. So I, in a, I, I in, in a better it. safe than sorry scenario, then, you'd have to ban me from going shopping with my daughter? Well, I don't think it needs to go necessarily that far. But well, I, how far would it go? You could stand outside the changing room. It, it's, it's about safety. Well, I, 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 don't wanna, I don't want to leave her on her own with adults. Well, then maybe we need to have a, a, a family changing room in the, in the shops. Maybe we need to have... But a we've already got that in swimming pools. In the swimming pools. We've already got that in swimming pools. I don't understand the point you're making now. Cubicles and, and family changing areas. We already have a choice, if you will, in a changing area. Yeah. And if you're not comfortable with the communal element of it, you can go somewhere else. Well, that, that's superb, isn't it? Isn't that what we're after? I thought that's what we had. Well, it depends, I think, on which swimming pool you go to. Possibly. I, I kind of lose my thread at this point because I think that what you do leads inexorably towards some sort of segregation, which I'm, for the record, I think I'm comfortable with, until men like me feel punished for the potential perversion of, of, of theoretical men who no doubt exist, but who seem to be given all the power over this story. I agree with you, because the yeah. problem is the men that don't behave appropriately, the men who are violent towards women and girls yes. and who we have to keep ourselves safe from. And unfortunately, if, if uh, men like you get cast in with those in order to keep us safe, surely that's better than having men with terrible intentions <sighs> being allowed to freely walk into... I think it, prob I think it probably is. I think it probably is better, but it does seem to me to speak to the same suspicion of men that allows some religious organisations to insist on segregation in, in all contexts. The idea that men can't control themselves, therefore all men can't be trusted. I don't think that, that that's it. It's that some men choose to treat women and girls atrociously. It's not to do with them not being able to control themselves. They're controlling their actions to treat women and girls atrociously. And therefore, we have to have spaces where those women and girls can feel safe. Yes, and and if the price of that is me not being able to go swimming with my daughters or, 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 or go shopping with them, then that is a price worth paying for the for the safety. Do we have any idea of the scale of the problem you describe? The the, the number of men who would uh, contemplate pretending to be women in order to get into a changing room. I, I've seen one or two cases of it happening, but they seem to be as rare as hen's teeth. And I'm not saying that minimises the the fear. I'm just conscious of the reality um, there are plenty of resources online I, I can't give you numbers off the top of my head but there okay. are plenty of resources online does it matter where there do, are lists the numbers matter lists. well no I suppose not but there are lists and lists of men who have pretended to be women in order to, to get close to women but of course it's not just pretending to be women um, men have joined the priesthood men have trained and become black taxi drivers men have done all football coaches in all, indeed in order to get close to their victims. Why are we going to do something that will make it exponentially easier for them?
Uh, be because the massive majority of men don't deserve to be treated as if they're potential sex offenders. I mean, this is the point at which you sound, whether you realise it or not, a little like that old school of thought that described all men as rapists. Um, I would hope that I don't come across like that. But to this I man you do, but, but I'm just one man being honest with you. And I appreciate I need that. to be treated like a potential rapist because rapists exist. No, you don't need to be treated like a potential rapist. We just need to keep safe spaces for women and girls free of men. That's what we have at the moment. Why don't we keep it? Except we don't have it at the moment. In, in the context of the changing rooms for children and the context of communal changing areas for swimming pools. I, I think I'm on your side, but I think the point at which... I get really confused. Is that point where you did, where you admitted you don't know at what point Barbara would be welcome to change alongside all women, not you because you're comfortable changing in front of anyone, but women who, who, are, who feel their dignity is being impinged. Some of them would never feel comfortable with Barbara if they were told that she used to have a penis. Yes. What do we do with them? Do we, do we take their feelings into account and exclude Barbara? Well, I think that probably the best thing to do is ask them how they feel. And we haven't been spoken to in this whole um, issue so far with the changes that have been suggested to the Gender Recognition Act changing towards self-identification. Women's groups and women haven't been consulted in that. At the moment, we have a petition going asking for women to be consulted. It's 2018, and we're asking for women's voices to be heard on a matter that will affect us, us massively. And, and I think that's the, the issue here, that we need to talk to one another. But there won't be consensus, will there? I, mean, I, I, I guess my vain quest is for consensus, and, and that's why Barbara's call was so pertinent, because you, you're cool with it, I, I'd be cool with it, but lots of women, I presume, who, who think that you're representing their interests wouldn't ever want Barbara to be allowed into their changing room, despite the fact that, that she no longer possesses the male equipment. So why don't we speak to them? Why don't we, we listen to their voices and then maybe... Oh, well, I think we are, don't we? We haven't as yet. OK. I'm struggling to find the lists and lists of cases of men, which isn't actually a, a problem, but because it, it, we did say, do the numbers matter? But I, I think as a man, and I appreciate that we're talking about why women should be listened to more, but this is women should be listened to more about what they want to say about men. As a man, I... I, I, I <laughs> I'd, I'd need to feel that it's a clear and present danger, and this is where you tell me, I think, that women always feel that predatory male behaviour is a clear and present danger. It's what we've been taught, yes. and, it, and it's how we've okay. experienced the world. I mean, if you think about all the things you do every day to keep yourself safe from other men, yes. it's probably slim to none. Whereas if you think about all the things that women do every day to keep themselves safe, we, rare, we vary our routes, we hold our keys in our hands, we don't park in a secluded car park yes. because it's cheaper. We have to take all these steps every day because we don't know which men will, will um, attack us because they don't wear a badge. And if the price that we pay to protect more spaces is that some transgender people or some I mean, even some transgender women feel peeved or, or discriminated against and more comfortably some self-identifying women feel excluded then that is a smaller penalty than the vulnerability that you'd be introducing into these environments by letting any Tom, forgive the pun, but any Tom, Dick or Harry come in who self-identifies as a woman. Exactly. Okay. It's a slow process this. I'm so grateful to you for, for, for helping me. I don't know that I'm quite where you are. Uh, final question, because a few people have picked up on it. Why is turf a term of abuse? Because it's used as a term of abuse. So um, it's something that's being slung around at women, generally on Twitter, often with the... Um, but isn't it sticks and stones? Turf scum, sorry? Isn't it? Well, obviously scum makes it an insult, but I'm interested in turf as a, as a standalone term. Is it, 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 it will... it, it's being used to shut people down. It's being used as as you are transphobic, you are exclusionary, and therefore we will not listen to your arguments. I'm on several lists on Twitter of turf blockers or turfs or see you next Tuesday, am I allowed to say that? Um, well, you have now. Because people are calling us these names for daring to want to talk about this issue and an issue that will massively affect us. It's used as a pejorative by people who cannot... <laughs> Or, or in a position where they are unable to use the words they actually want to use about us, which are probably not appropriate for... Um, well, then again, you've, you've, you've got me even more confused now. So you don't like that word tough because you think it's a substitute for words you really don't like? Well, it's because it's being used as an insult. Trans-exclusionary is self-description, isn't it? I mean, you do want to exclude trans people from places. 
No, I, I want to keep women's spaces for women. I've got nothing exclusionary about trans. It's excluding everyone apart from women. So it, well, it is exclusionary, then. So trans, the T works, the E works. No, the T doesn't work. It's also men exclusionary. Well, OK, so you want to be called a turf stroke murph. Well, I think also we get called swerfs, which is sex worker exclusionary rights. Well, uh, not, not by me, you well, don't. I, I've only just found out what turf men. But these are things thrown at us from trans activists to shut us down. Well, it's not working, is it? Well, not so far today. Well, that, that, that's kind of what I mean. What, what, what would you prefer to be called? Oh, my name's Hannah. That works for me. But in terms of describing the position that you were defending when you went into the men only swimming session on Friday, I, I mean, what do we call you? So, a something you can, activist? No, you could call me a feminist. You could just call me a woman. I was. I was well, the F in turf stands for feminist, doesn't it? So it needs to yeah. distinguish you from other feminists who who, who aren't trans exclusionary, but or men exclusionary. Trans people. We're talking about changing rooms. Yes. I am. Um, <sighs> I thank you, I really do, and I, and I, I understand the massive majority of what you've said to me, but I think being human, possibly being male, I can't quite understand all of it. And, and again, I, it, it depends how big the problem is, doesn't it? 03456060973. Whew, 11.49 is the time, I told you it'd be tricky. 11.53 is the time, press conference underway in which David Davis and the European Union's chief Brexit negotiator Michel Barnier will... Um, hopefully reveal some sort of progress has been made. I don't know that we've made much progress this hour. I, I think on the issue of trans and um, uh, the question of segregated changing rooms, which are relatively normal, then for me, and I don't know if, if my opinion matters particularly, but when I talk about going shopping with my little girl, obviously um, I'm not a single parent. What if I was? What if it was just me and my daughter? What do I do then if I'm not allowed in the changing rooms, just in case another man is using a, a, a young girl as a kind of camouflage? I, I think numbers do matter. I think that's the point where Hannah and I would probably dis, depart from each other. I, I think numbers do matter. Because, it, to use a really simplistic analogy, if you're working out where to put a pedestrian crossing or a bridge, you're going to count how many road accidents there have been in that area, Right? Otherwise, you're not going to put it on a road that no one ever crosses. So what you do when you're identifying whether or not measures need to be taken to address risk is surely you work out how big the risk is. That's why I asked her, what, what, do numbers matter? The number of men who use a, 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 a female child to get into a changing area, the number of men who claim that they're women despite not having had any surgical um, treatment in order to get into places where they can do bad things. The problem I've got as a feminist is I completely respect the women who, who do feel threatened by men. Perhaps not quite on the scale that Anna describes, but as a, as a sort of background noise to their life, the predatory nature of men. We don't need any lessons in that, do we? But in terms of changing areas, I, I, I've got two problems here now. I don't think it's unreasonable to say to people in possession of penises that they can't get changed in the female area. But then a lot of self-identifying women will have a problem with me for saying that. I think that I think the people I trust the most on this are the people who are completely confused, which is kind of the polar opposite of how we normally do business together. Caitlin's in Newcastle. Caitlin, what would you like to say? Um, hello, James. Hello, Caitlin. Um, I just wanted to... Uh... I think what you just said, actually, is, is the crux of this point. Uh, this whole idea that this uh, the self-ID law is going to be abused... Yes. Um, it all comes down to that, no doesn't it? ...foundation. Look at, look at the Republic of Ireland. They've had self-ID for trans people now since 2015. Have they? Yes. It was just after they passed the laws for um, same-sex marriage... Since 2015, they've had the ability for trans people to self-identify their legal gender. And that would and enable that, issues, that would yeah. entitle them to go into a communal changing area in full if they wanted that would, to. That would entitle them to change their passport, to do everything that that you would be. E even if I still, in. even if I still had a penis. Yes. So I could go into the women-only changing area. Uh, forgive. Can we, can we, I uh, want to have this discussion as well. I'll give you all the time you want, Caitlin. Tell me a bit about yourself first, if you would. Okay, so 
I was brought up in London in the... Uh, well, I was born in 86. Yeah. Um, I was born, uh, born to a family of Irish immigrants to this country. Um, my father was a hell's angel. He was a massive bigot. Um, I personally never learned anything about LGBT issues growing up. It wasn't on education or anything like that. I always knew I was different. I didn't know how different until yeah. I actually found out that trans people even existed when I was 18, when I was already 18. At that point, you're already pretty much, you've gone through puberty, you've gone through all of those issues. I suffered through six, seven years of massive depression, um, substance abuse, everything like that to try and hide yeah. Yeah. away from, from all of these issues. I didn't believe that I could make it. There was the idea that I had to be beautiful and that I would never be able to reach that plateau and that I shouldn't even bother. Um, so that that's where I'm coming at this. From, okay. from, from the age of, of, of 26 onwards, I, that was when I came out as trans after several attempts at suicide yeah. I might have had. Um, basically as a thing of if I don't do something about this I'm not going to be here much longer. Because this is so, not me. I am not this This is not me. Person. This is, um, I am living a complete facade. I, I think again, I, I, I don't want to do Esprit de Scalier because she was kind enough to give us a lot of her time but I don't quite understand how Hannah can describe what you've just described as feelings. <laughs> not feelings. James, if I, if I thought these were feelings, when I came out as transgender, I lost my fiancé, I lost my friends, I lost my job. I, um, because I was in a house here with my friends who abandoned me, I lost my house. My family completely and utterly rejected me. I lost everything in my life. Yes. That I feared, everything I feared that was going to happen, that, happened. That's it, isn't it? Cause the, and, the, and the portrayal you hear is that people like you do things like this on some sort, either on a whim... It is literally, yeah, it, it's some kind of whim, that, that one day we wake up and then there's this thing. It was years, James. It was absolutely I, I believe years. you. I believe you. Through, through my entire teenage, from, from the moment puberty hit me, I realised I was different. Yes. But I sat there and I was in a situation where I look at the boys and I say, well, I don't feel like a boy. Yeah. And I look at the girls and I say, but I don't look like a girl. So where do I fit in this? And not having any education, not having any exposure to anyone in the LGBT situation, we just cast adrift in this without any guidance. I hear you. Like that. And, until, I, until eventually, you know, it came I hear you. to me that, that there are people actually that, that do feel like this and that there is an answer. And... On that front, and I'm so glad you were listening today, I think you're magnificent for the record, absolutely magnificent. I don't know that I'd have the mental strength to endure what you've endured and to, and to emerge from it with so much dignity intact. But it, it, from the point of view of other people, whether people like Hannah, who you heard talking, or, or, or others who um, uh, feel that your experience does not make you a woman... Mm -hmm. And you know they exist. You deal with them more than I do. I deal with them on a daily basis. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Is there any point of connection? Is there any meeting here? It's in the context of, of changing areas, which is what we're talking about now. I don't know yeah. where you are on the on the physical graph, and, and ne neither do I need to know. I just want to know whether you feel... If I, for example... I could maliciously self-identify tomorrow in order to get myself into a female changing room. The more I say that out loud, the more I think it's a little yeah. bit ridiculous to use it that as... It is a little bit ridiculous, James, because let me ask you. Go on. Has anyone who has wanted to, 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 to already... They're a criminal at this point, right? If somebody wants yeah, to commit true. a sexual... Do you think the sign on the door is going to stop somebody that wants to commit these acts? Do you honestly believe... No, I that, don't. That is the case. No, I don't. Let me tell you who is who is most at risk in changing rooms and toilets. You. It's trans people. It's you, isn't it? And the evidence there is absolutely overwhelming. I myself have been sexually assaulted three times in my lifetime, James. Mm. Okay? Yeah. I, I've lived through that. I know what that feels like. And to... 
to basically have people turn around and say, you shall be denied all rights until you get into either a financial situation to go privately, which is now going to happen for me, unfortunately, it's just not, you know, I'm not going to be able to suddenly sprout 15 grand no. overnight to be able to get the surgery, never mind... No, I hadn't thought, I hadn't thought of it. that, so if we're, okay. as, as, as we did, we're saying if you've had... Go, let's, yeah. let's go back to your earlier situation, who do I rely on? The NHS. The NHS's waiting list at the moment for gender identity clinics is 24 months, yeah. okay? That's just to get your first appointment. That's just to speak to your first... And, and the reason why, the reason why you can't... To start your hormone. I hear you, I hear you, I'm getting it now. And the reason, because some people listening will be thinking, well, why don't you just go in the men's changing room? And the point is that you might be having hormone treatment. You might, because you identify as a woman, you dress as a woman, you might have made your... Mm -hmm. As we all do when we leave, well, so, as most... So I'm supposed to dress... Yeah, and, and that's why you end up being a greater risk of sexual assault. I go into a male toilet, oh, what mate. is going to happen to me? Okay? No, the... the, the, the the point I'd like to, to add to, the, to what the woman said earlier. Yes. All respect to her. Of I course. understand exactly where women feel on the whole sexual assault. Let me add to this, okay? Imagine living with that fear all of the time and the fear that you could be physically assaulted by anyone, male or female, at any moment. I am terrified of using the toilets when I go out in public. Yeah. Even when I go to... Um, places where it is ex like it's explicitly written on the toilet doors trans women are allowed to use these toilets and if you have an issue with it speak to the barkeep yeah. even in that situation even when it is expressly written there for everyone to see I still would rather sit there James to be really blunt with you yeah. I would rather sit there for three hours needing a pee and not go to the toilet and hold it and wait until I got home. And there are so many trans people that are exactly in the same situation where even with explicit permission, there is still that barrier there because we are so worried. And and, and, and it's not... It, it's, it's us. I, I, I don't want to have to go to a toilet and walk out of a cubicle and have someone walk in and and start a vow with me and grab me by the hand, throw me out and call me all these slurs and everything like this, call me a man and kick me out of the toilet because I just want to go to the toilet. I hear you. I hear you, and I make your promise now. I, I, as long as these stories remain in the news, you, you'll have a you'll have an opportunity here to put forward your story and and your feelings and your thoughts, Caitlin. Yeah. All right. Yeah. As long as I've got a job. As long as I've got a job. I have to go to the news now. Five minutes late, but as long as I've got a job, you'll have a voice. All right. We do need a voice. That's it. I get that. Do I don't know that I agree with everything you've said. Um, but but I also, I'm glad we had the conversation we had with Hannah. The one thing we could all agree on is we need to talk more, which is kind of where I come in. Quite a strange day today. We started the programme wondering why there's been a 12.4% increase in mortalities in the first seven weeks of this year compared to last year. Um, uh, just in excess of 10,000 unexpected deaths and arrived at... And, and do you know, it's funny because I wasn't looking for political answers to that question. I was looking for operational ones or medical ones or things that are fixable. But the consensus was from consultant psychiatrists down that it's an inevitable upshot of the programme of cuts and austerity that we've seen visited upon this country. And quite a few of you pointing out that thing that was doing the rounds a few years ago, the number of members the House of Lords and Commons who have shares in private health care. I'm pretty close to coming out and saying it. My, my general belief in the goodness of people prevents me from buying in completely to the idea that, uh, that mortalities are a price you pay in order to change the, NH the healthcare system in order to turn a profit on your shares. I still can't quite believe that that mindset would be widespread enough to, to, to win. But in the absence of alternative analyses, I'm pretty close to... to sticking all my money on that horse. I really am. Then we started a conversation about trans issues with reference to two stories, which for me highlighted some of the problems with the story. I'm not sure I'm any less confused than I was now at the, at the beginning, because after speaking to Hannah, one of the women that um, went to a men-only swimming session um, topless, so she was pretending to self-identify as a man in order to show how easy it would be for a man pretending to self-identify as a woman to get into a place. But then you speak to Caitlin, um, who 
I, I'm not comfortable dismissing as merely having feelings. And again, when you ask the question of at what point does the surgery become significant enough to allow these women to go into the women's changing room? But then I also think about periods. Forgive me for being so blunt. But I, I, I think, as a man, the, the, the thing that we can never fully empathise with or understand with women is, is the biological um, fertility-related stuff, the menstruation, the childbirth, all of the things, all of the things that essentially constitute a big part of womanhood. But could I look Caitlin in the eye and tell her that she has to continue running the gamut of abuse and violence because of a theoretical fear of abuse and violence on another side of a... I just don't know. So I'll shut up and listen. That seems to work. Ros is in Streatham. Ros, what would you like to say? Hello, good afternoon. Hello, um, Ros. It is... It's partly this issue that you've raised about uh, fear. It's partly that. And I believe it's the British Psychiatry Association that spoke to the um, committee at Parliament that said that in terms of male prisoners like Jessica Win uh, Winfield, who actually committed a double rape under the name Martin Pointing, he was then put into a female prison where he's been sexually molesting women. Well, I, I don't... You see, I, I appreciate this is an incredibly powerful issue and I've got no reason to doubt you, but if you don't tell the producer that I you're going to... I want to take it further than I'm, that. I'm sure you do, but I'm going to tell you what you can and can't... I'm going to tell you what you can and can't do. If you don't tell the producer that you're going to come on air and name names while making allegations of criminal activity. I can't trust you. No, 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 it's, it, it's not. It's, um, this is well reported. This is, is not did you tell the producer you were going to do that? No. Well, then I can't trust you because I don't have the depth of knowledge. I don't have the... If, so I can't check on that. It's very simple. It's why you don't come straight on air, Ros. It's why I don't pick up the phone and go, hello, you're live on LBC. We police incredibly difficult subjects with incredibly professional colleagues. You insult them, you insult me, and you insult my listeners when you leapfrog that to make named and specific claims. And, and I'm sorry, but I can't trust you anymore. I'll talk to, I'll talk to you again, but these rules aren't put there for fun, people. Zoe's in Guildford. Zoe, what would you like to say? Hey, Zoe. Um, hey, Zoe. Hey, James. I'll be James. You be um, Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> Long time listener. Big fan of yours. Thank you. Very nervous, hence getting your name on. I'm sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to... I'm transgender. I've been living full-time as the real me for the last year, just over a year now. Um, the... The issue is with the change rooms. I'm, I belong to a I belong to a gym with a spa and a pool and all the rest of it. Yes. Um, I live full time as me, um, and believe me, I'm what's known as a very reluctant trans woman. I would do anything. I would do anything not to to be Zoe. Um, it, it, it does seem to be it does seem to be an awful lot to uh, uh, endure and undergo merely. F in pursuit of attention or, or to fulfil a whim, doesn't it? I'm glad you've made that point. I'd have thought every trans woman was reluctant in some sense. There's just varying degrees. You, you can't believe how reluctant. I, mean, I, I knew this about myself since I was three years old. And, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think, unless I'd experienced it myself, I wouldn't believe that a, a young child could be so categoric. No. Um, and it, to me, it still doesn't make sense. But I remember being three years old, looking at myself, thinking, what the hell's gone wrong here? This, 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 isn't, <laughs> this just isn't right. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm waffling on. You're not. I'll give you a bit of background. Yes. Um, so, I mean, growing up, my parents found out when I was, you know, a very young child, again, seven, eight, nine years old. Wouldn't talk about it. This was the late 70s, early 80s, so, you know... Um, I learned it was wrong. I learned it was to be ashamed of, to be suppressed. Um, I remember thinking that I'll deal with it again when I become a teenager. But then when I was 13, my sister, and only sibling, she got killed. And my parents went, well, breakdowns and alcoholism and all the rest of it. So I could hardly say, well, you know that daughter you've lost? Well, how about this? Um, so again, I, I just kept... I kept denying it, I kept suppressing it, I kept fighting it, and that's how I've lived my life. Got married, had kids. Um, and then a few years ago, I, you know, it, it never went away. I mean, it was always, my whole life, it's the first thing you think of when you wake up, yes. the last thing you think of when you go to sleep, and it doesn't ever leave your mind. 
whilst you're awake. It's like how I would imagine it would be to live with a chronic backache. It's always there, always eats away at you. You always, you, you try and build a life, you try and get along with things, but it's, you, it's always there, it's always just eating away. Do you, do and, you, do you accept though that some men could pretend to be in the foothills of what you've described in order to gain access to currently female-only areas? Is that, is that a fear that you recognise or understand? Yes, yeah, I think, I think that can happen. I mean, there are, yes. there are very nasty people out there that will do all sorts of abhorrent things. And the argument um, is that because those nasty people exist, you shouldn't be allowed to get changed in a female-only facility. For the last year, just over a year, I did full time as a woman. I'm, I'm on hormones, testosterone blockers. Yes. Um, I haven't had surgery because I think, as previous callers have alluded to, it's um, I'm going through the NHS process and it's it's a very very long process. Yes. You know, now it's two years to get your first appointment. I, I had to wait a year for my first appointment. That's just to speak to somebody. Gosh. And it's another year before I got hormones. And then it's going to be another couple of years before I end up having surgery. And a lot of people in my situation actually elect not to have surgery because it's such a major operation. Um, so some people elect to have the testosterone blocking, have the, have the hormones, but not actually end up having full surgery. Um, and, and, and then that's really, I, I, I know we're oversimplifying everything, um, but the debate, for want of a better word, seems to be between people who think that, actually, you know, I'm losing it, Zoe, it's such a tricky one. This, <laughs> I, I, you can see why, can't you? So you are legally and chemically female, but not physically. I'm, I'm, I'm chemically female, yes. I'm not physically uh, female. That's the hormones. I belong to, I belong to a decent gym. Um, yes. I, I use the female changing rooms. Where else am I going to use? I can hardly stroll into the, into the gym. Because, in, so it, I'm, apart I'm, I'm, from, I'm, I'm, forgive me, but apart from the contents of your undercrackers, you are, to all intents and purposes, female. That's exactly it. I've, you know, I've developed breasts and everything, you know. Well, <laughs> I can, <laughs> it's, it's not possible. But you know what, I, I have some sense of modesty, and I'm, I'm of obviously always very conscious of, of where I am, i.e. in the female changing rooms. I don't, you know, stroll around flaunting. No, but some men I'm might, and then I'm, then I'm back to understanding why... <clears throat> Some women think that the price you pay to protect them from the man you've just described, with it all sort of, you know, swinging in the wind, the price you pay for that is somehow to discriminate against you, but then they have to explain why you, with breasts and a, at the moment, and a penis, you have to go into the men's and run the gauntlet of the men's changing room with, as, as Caitlin described to us, the prospect of all sorts of abuses unfolding. There's, there's absolutely no way I'd ever even consider it. There's... It, it, it would. I would not be able to do that, and I wouldn't do that. I would have, you know, if 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 I was never allowed to use a female changing room, I would not be able to go swimming, to a gym, and go to a or gym again, or anything like that. But you know, in in the female changing room, there's um there's a, a cubicle because most of it's open plan. Yes, there is a cubicle for um. For people that are well, we, everyone could. Every, no, no, lots of people are a bit modest, aren't they? Not everyone likes getting their getting their getting their kits off in front of anyone. Though some people don't even do it in front of their own family. So there's, there should always be opportunities. There are, there, are, there are a couple of cubicles with doors for people that want the extra modesty. And if I'm changing into swimming costumes, I have to get completely naked. Yes. I use one of those. Yeah. Well, it's, and, within the, it's, within the, it's within the women's changing room, but I use one of those. And do you ever have problems? Never, never once. And that, that's, I guess, I guess I've, I've managed to count today trans women who need access to female changing rooms, but I, I, I take on trust. And there, there are some stories out there, but the harder you have to search for them, the, I don't know, the, the, the harder it becomes to think that they somehow counterbalance or outweigh Zoe and Caitlin's experiences. A quick glance in the rear view mirror, that rather uncomfortable call with Roz, um, which I had to curtail because she started making allegations about named individuals that I just didn't have the knowledge. If she'd spoken to, 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 to Alex or Sandra, who's producing today, and just said, I'm going to mention this, we check, and then we can all go ahead. So ju just to clarify, um, a, a man called Martin Ponting, who now identifies as a trans woman and is known as Jessica Winfield, was indeed convicted of raping two girls in 1995 and sentenced to life imprisonment. He has subsequently identified as a trans woman and been moved to 
a women's prison where it was reported in September 2017 he'd been segregated from the female general population after making what were called unwanted advances. Um, I, I, and I don't know enough to read any more into that, but I, I would say that I, that that does seem to me to be a very relevant case to the conversations we were having. But whether or not all men and all trans women should suffer as a result of the behaviour of this human being is a conversation for another day. I am